So I'm going to start doing that and uh, and also just vamp a little bit while we get Megan's video to join us as well. We have a, a lot of a lot of people on the panel today. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Josh Simmons. I'm the president of the Open Source Initiative, uh, starting my, my fifth year of board service. And uh, I want to I want to start this session with some gratitude. Uh, first, I want to really say thank you to the uh, to the to the vendors who are supporting this event. Uh, seriously, hats off to to Kathy and Jen and Sean and whoever the captioner is. Really, everybody who's made this work. Uh, it's this is such an important event for us, and I'm, I'm so grateful for the time and energy you've put into this. It's uh, it's been pretty great. Um, now, of course, I couldn't, I can't just thank our vendors. I, I need to thank uh, Hong Fook as the chair of the event who has been driving to make this happen. Yeah, honestly, um, this has been a labor of love. I can't overstate that. Um, not only do I want to thank Hong Fook, who has been driving this from the board side, I also want to thank, uh, I'm going to start chronologically. I also want to thank Patrick Masson. Uh, Patrick was OSI's first full time staff member, hired in 2013. Uh, he spent many, many months and untold hours uh, getting the, the project, uh, I mean, on OSI, but also getting state of the store source running. Uh, by the time uh, Patrick left us in July, uh, this thing was on rails. There was no way of stopping it. Um, and so I'm, I'm so grateful uh, to Patrick for his service in general. We'll talk more about that later, uh, but specifically for getting state of the source running. Um, and then I want to thank Deb Nicholson, our new general manager. Uh, who started uh, her first day at the end of August and the beginning of September. And uh, suffice it to say, you can tell we've thrown her right into the deep end. She's here presenting with us in the panel and we couldn't be happier to have Deb with us. Uh, so thank you, Deb, for jumping right in and, and being here with us. Um, gratitude is gonna be a theme for this intro. Uh, I also wanna thank the speakers and attendees. Honestly, uh, no event, an event, you know, like if there are no speakers and attendees, the event doesn't happen. Uh, so I want to really uh, express my gratitude to everybody who submitted proposals to the call for proposals. Uh, a lot of tough choices were made there. I want to thank the, uh, the the speakers who got through and put in the time and energy to create their presentations and be here with us to answer questions from attendees. Uh, and then I want to thank the attendees because, of course, you know, speaking to an empty room, that that's no good for anybody. Um, this event has, you know, for a first year event has just blown beyond any expectations I had. And really it's all thanks to the speakers and attendees who are making this, who are bringing the important conversations here and really engaging in good faith. So I wanna talk a little bit, just to set some scenery, set the scene a little bit uh, about where OSI is at right now and, and what, what I'm excited about in the coming year. And then I'll hand it off uh, and we'll all do some intros. You know, this year, OSI is working through uh, a transformation, the second major transformation since it was founded in 1998. And this trans transformation, you know, maybe 2020 is the year where it's really culminating, but this has been years in the making. Um, while the results of the transformation we're going through will be an OSI with um, radically improved capabilities, the process itself it's not all that radical. Uh, this is a natural part of the nonprofit sort of organizational development life cycle. You know, we started as a band of self-selected volunteers um, who stood up an organization because they knew that something was needed. In 2013, the board introduced community elections to make sure that there was better representation and help give OSI that, that, fresh, that regular injection of fresh perspective to make sure that the organization would evolve with the community. The other key thing that they did in 2013, we hired Patrick, our first full-time staff member. And at that point, OSI transitioned from being volunteer operated to being staff operated. But while Patrick was at the helm, really, you know, in the driver's seat, the board and all the volunteers, we were still backseat driving and we, we still are. So OSI right now is a staff operated organization, but volunteer driven and volunteer supported. Now the, trans the transformation we're going through now is to a model where we're gonna be staff driven and staff operated while the volunteers work on supervision and, uh, and guidance. 
basically, we don't want to rely so much on volunteer labor, labor for core operations. It's just not sustainable, especially not in an age when OSI needs to really rise to the occasion of, of all the challenges that there are in open source. Anyhow, we're not resting on our laurels as we do this self-work. As an org with stakeholders in over 55 countries, with 125 organizational allies representing hundreds of thousands of people, we don't get to hit pause. Uh, we've got the Floss Desktops for Kids program that's been operational, uh, something that's especially near and dear to my heart uh, in the wake of the, the, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, because the Floss Desktops for Kids program, not only does it put Floss, free and open source software, in the hands of kids, you know, middle schoolers and below, uh, I think some high schools as well, not only does it put free and open source software in their hands, it gives them a computer that they can take home you know, and they, they go through the experience of building that computer so there's ownership with it. And that program, over 50% of the beneficiaries of that program are, are black indigenous people of color uh, uh, students and, and kids. And so that's really meaningful. Um, we also have the open source technology management program with Brandeis University. That's an educational program we've been rolling out in, in partnership with them. Pam here has been really busy with license review process reform. Uh, we've invested a lot in moderation over the last year. Uh, the standards, uh, the standards business has been very uh, keeping us on our toes. Um, I, I won't speak to that, but there's a lot going on in that space as well. Uh, we've had Alana here and, and people on the board who are really invested in membership doing quarterly affiliate calls that Italo started a, a year or two ago, and those have really proved a, a great resource to make sure that the, the community is coming together and we're comparing notes and supporting each other. Don't worry, I'm about to wrap up. Lastly, we have this event too. I cannot overstate how important State of the Source is for us. This may be just the first event, but I think I would say that this is uh, really a demarcation line for us. You know, OSI has been, I think, rightly criticized for not being a leading voice in many of the conversations that are happening around open source. This, this is the beginning of us changing that ship, um, of steering that ship in a different direction. We want to be a leading voice. And we don't want to be the one speaking on your behalf all the time. We want you to be here. We want to bring your voice to the table and provide you a platform as well. So this is really an important event and it's taken a lot of energy to get this over the line. So I'm, I'm very grateful for all that. Uh, none of this would be possible, but for my peers here on the board, uh, nor without our staff, both past and present. Um, again, I really want to thank Patrick here, who is our, our formal general manager, but still has a professional relationship with us transitioning the organization to a point where we will eventually hire someone like an executive director. Patrick put in seven years um, and let's just say he didn't have 40 hour work weeks. He had startup hours um, and he made a lot of sacrifices and just, you know, none of, nothing that we're doing now would be possible but for Patrick. We are, we are endlessly grateful for him. Uh, he will go down in the history books with us. Um, and then, you know, Patrick resigned in, in July. Uh, and just this month, we have Deb Nicholson, our new internal general manager, starting with us. And uh, we just, you know, we, 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 we couldn't be happier about that. And we are so fortunate to have both of these, these people to have served as staff past and present. Um, I think the, the whole community owes them a debt of gratitude. Nobody will ever really understand the full scope of how busy they are and how much work we put on their shoulders. Um, so in closing, thank you all for being here. Uh, I will toss it to uh, Hong Fook, or, or am I tossing it to Deb, sorry. I think everyone was just gonna do a quick intro and say their name and uh, the we were gonna tell the audience to try and think about questions they wanted to ask while those intros happened. Um, I've got, well, going left to right on my screen, I have Chris next. Um, in terms of brief introduction, I'm Chris um, uh, from the UK. Uh, very nice to meet you all. I don't know how long we want to go, but um, yeah, hi. Uh, Deb? Other Deb, obviously. Yes. Hi, I'm Deb Bryant. Okay. Um, Ilana? Sorry. 
Sorry, uh, it wouldn't let me unmute. I had a little audio disconnect there. Uh, hi, I'm <laughs> Alana Hashman. Uh, I've been a member of the OSI board since April 2019, uh, and I currently work as a uh, principal site reliability engineer at Red Hat. Uh, Faden? Hello, uh, my name is Feren. Um I, um, I I live in Greece. Um, I've been uh, a member of uh, of the board of directors since uh, 2018, uh, and um, one of the affiliate seats. Um, I professionally uh, I'm uh, engineering. I work uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit supporting Wikipedia. Also, an OSI affiliate member uh, as a director of engineering there. Um, and I'm also affiliated with the Debian project as well. Um, Hang Fook? Yes, so my name is Hong Fook Deng. Uh, originally from Vietnam, I joined the board at the same time with Elena last year, uh, April. Um, I'm also associated with Force Asia. I'm one of the founders uh, there. Yeah, that is about me. Great. Um, Italo? Uh, Italo Vignoli from uh, Italy, as my first name says. Uh, uh, I'm uh, involved uh, in the LibreOffice project, uh, and uh, I think I represent the users, not being, not having any technology background. Um, and then we have Pam. I guess we lost Megan again for a minute, unless she's on just... Okay, Pam, you're up. Yep. Uh, I'm Pam Chastek. I also joined the board a little over a year ago in April of 2019. I am a lawyer in private practice in Raleigh, North Carolina. Awesome. Um, do folks from the audience have questions? Because this is a little bit of an AMA if, um, where, where you get to ask whatever you're wondering about uh, the OSI and its, you know, plans and thoughts. Um, not yet. I, uh, Patrick, no? This, did, did Patrick uh, introduce already? Oh, um, Patrick, did you want to introduce yourself? I wasn't sure. I was going to leave it with the glorious introduction that Josh did. But um, if you want to also say something, that would be great. I'll, uh, I'm good. Josh did a fantastic job. Thanks. Um, How about yeah. Deb? Did we hear from Deb Nicholson on uh, the new GM? He made me sound better than I normally do when I introduce myself, too. So I, I think what we learned is Josh is really good at introductions. Maybe we'll just have him introduce everybody next time. But uh, I am excited to uh, be the new GM, and I'm excited to – Patrick's been uh, super great as uh, helping on the transition. So, um, And we have a question from the audience. Uh, so uh, what are the OSI's plans to address the outreach challenge I talked about yesterday on my uh, lightning talk? Jomar, do you want to um, say, uh, I'm not sure if every single person on today's panel was at yesterday's lightning talk. Do you want to say uh, one or two things about your, um, what, you were, what you would like us to speak to on there? Okay. Oh, so many people are typing. Let's go ahead and take the second question, and then we'll come back on that one. Um, what's it look like to grow from a volunteer organization to a nonprofit that is self-sustaining? Who'd like to speak to that? I'll go ahead and jump in. Oh, I see Megan's mic is working, and I think maybe uh, she might also be a good person to speak to this point. Sure. And just to repeat, the question was, what is it like to kind of evolve your nonprofit? Or um, I guess more specifically, like to grow from a volunteer organization to a nonprofit that is self-sustaining. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's, it's, you know, certainly complex because you want to keep the spirit of volunteerism, but you also want to create a board where they're kind of focusing more on this kind of advisory, strategic, and direction, and then there's also staff that can then help with the strategy and turn it into the operational plans. And um, it requires uh, the board making a shift, like a very intentional shift, and really coming up with that, 
that strategic direction of where they want to go and redefining that relationship between the board and staff. Um, and what kind of uh, staff do you need to start building out to take over some of that volunteer work? And of course, you want to think about where there can still be volunteerism. So it's not just all on staff as well. And then um, as you think about the staffing and the programs that you're going to do to really step into the mission of your nonprofit, you, of course, need funding to support all of that. So as part of that plan, you need to think about what is sustainable funding look like to support this staff, this growing staff and the programs that you need to do. Um, and so it's a very multifaceted, intentional process um, to make that shift. And um, hopefully that kind of gives a little insight into some of the things we're working on these days. Cool. Um, uh, the other question, the rest of the other question was, uh, where do the OSI's plans to address the outreach challenges with regards to people who use open source but don't really understand what it is? I can call on folks or you all are so polite. Who would like to take that one on? Okay. I can take it. Okay. Uh, Great. I think uh, uh, there are many, uh, many issues uh, uh, about this topic. Um, the uh, users are attracted by open source uh, in many cases because it's free free as in beer uh, not free as in freedom unfortunately but uh, and uh, uh, so they they in many cases they see it uh, uh, as a low-cost replacement of a proprietary product and uh, when they approach uh, uh, open source this way is then it's very difficult to uh, bring them to the to the right side uh, either they are very curious uh, actually i uh, started in open source uh, 18 years ago exactly because it was free as in beer but then i was amazed by the community and i uh, tried to understand the community but not everyone has this same attitude i think uh, we have a huge responsibility in communicating better what open source is uh, we should be more uh, um, united uh, or uh, we, we should be a, a huge community communicating uh, open source uh, in many cases we lose uh, a lot of time by discussing between different communities i've seen uh, conferences where different Linux distros were uh, discussing about their merits or their demerits in some cases, instead of convincing the users about moving to any one of the Linux distros instead of using Windows or Macintosh. I think uh, uh, we have, uh, as OSI, we have a huge responsibility in leading this kind of uh, um, proactive and educational communication to the users uh, is not easy. Uh, users are so many and are so scattered around uh, that reaching them all is uh, practically impossible. But everyone uh, who is supporting open source should uh, back uh, uh, OSI and not only OSI, of course, uh, in promoting open source uh, uh, horizontally, not just my open source product or my open source technology but open source in general and then uh, once the users has been educated then uh, they will make their choice and i think uh, we should be happy about any choice uh, which is uh, uh, really open source um i'm of course i'm i'm one of the founders of li the libreoffice project so of course uh, if everyone would use libreoffice i would be the most happy <laughs> person in the world but I know that this is impossible, so uh, I would like them uh, to use an an open source productivity software. Then, uh, if it's LibreOffice, I'm happy. If it's not LibreOffice, I'm happy as well. Uh, they should learn about open standards. We oh, we, we have a question about, about standards start. coming. So, <laughs> so uh, that is my take on the topic. So, yeah. Solidarity and um, better communication 
uh, with the community and education. That's that's awesome. Um, uh, there is another question about standards, if we want to just jump off from the end there. Um, so uh, this person says, Josh mentioned interesting times with standards activities. Obviously, this is interesting to us standards people, too. Does the board or some of the active stakeholders have plans for the OSR? I don't know if, Josh, you want to start there since um, you, you sort of dropped the interesting standards in. I mean, interesting times on the standards activity. Can, can I just ask for a clarification on what OSR stands for? Oh, yeah. What does OSR stand for? That's Jamie from Oasis. Oh, there we go. Oh, hi, Jamie. Oh, does that answer what, who that no, is? No, but, um, uh, no. No, yeah. what is OSR? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. I, sh I, I should know this, but. Um, there's a lot of O's in, like, O acronyms in our space, I think. Um, so we don't know what OSR is. It's the open standards requirement. Ah, okay. Thank you, Alana. So the open standards requirement. Being, I'm, I, maybe I shouldn't be answering this question then. I, I was hoping I could answer the question, but I think I maybe don't understand the question. I don't know, Deb, if, if you have, uh, if you're understanding the question better than I am. Uh, I don't think so. No, the other um, Deb. I'm sorry. Oh, the other Deb might. Yes, sorry. Oh, that's, it is going to. See, it'd be better if one of us was tall. Uh, so, so just a, a clarifying question. So, are, are you asking a question about w w how we relate to the implementation? I'm not sure what the use case is. So, I think they want to know bit? if we have plans for the open standards requirement uh, um, to to incorporate it into. So, so we so OSI is traditionally focused on the OSD. We've talked about other things like open data standards and such in the past, but really our main charter is, is, is open source software and open source licensing. There's a tremendously important relationship between open source software and open standards. In fact, you really can't have open source software without open standards. But we don't currently have any plans to incorporate that in, into our, our own standard, if that makes sense. That's a, a companion. Uh, uh, standard uh, and uh, an initiative, so to speak, that's, that's complementary. But I, if I'm understanding the question, we don't have uh, any plans to, to write it into part of our charter. If that makes sense. I think that's well covered by organizations like OASIS and other standards organizations. We do have an increasingly active standards organization. We're doing quite a bit today in, in Europe. You're going to probably see more outreach. Uh, Pam is the chair of our standards uh, committee, which is why she was brave enough to ask the clarifying question, because we all want to make sure we understand what's being asked. Uh, and I uh, and we're looking forward to that. We think that's both an opportunity for education. It's also turning into a bit of a battlefield, so to speak. I, uh, I use that term in terms of conflict of con, uh, concepts between proprietary vendors and the standards are creating in areas like telecommunications, for instance, and Etsy in Europe. And so it's really it's a, an important place for uh, open source to be able to influence, to make sure we don't accidentally have open source redefined in the industry, and also continue to educate. So I hope that's uh, helpful to addressing the question. So um, someone, I'm assuming Jamie, um, threw a link in the uh, notes, which is the that was me. OSI's. Oh, it's the OSI's own webpage on open standards requirements, which I frankly had never seen before. It looks like it's from 2000, this 2006 page. So uh, one sort of one of the interesting aspects of uh, historic websites. So mm -hmm. so um, just to, to sort of defy the statement of we're not interested in open standards requirement, I will point out we have a page about it. <laughs> But I think as as what um, Deb did a good job of summarizing what Joshua was alluding to in his opening remarks is where we're currently spending a lot of energy and effort is ensuring that um, standard setting bodies are not net trying to basically play with the definition of open source in a way that's going to be harm harmful to the open source definition or the open source ecosystem as a whole or the development of open source software. So there's a lot, there's some tension there and we're, we're working to try to make sure that nothing untoward happens. Great. 
Um, I think this one hopefully won't need too much clarification. Um, we have a question from Justin Flory about um, affiliate membership has three different options, nonprofit, education, and user community. Is there room for organizations that do not fit these organizational archetypes? And he says, e.g., NGOs and UN agencies. Um, so I think I guess we know where that question is coming from. Um, yeah, um, I can maybe take that one as awesome. membership chair and currently processing affiliate memberships and certainly recruiting a lot of affiliates. Um, so, I mean, as far as we're concerned, uh, you know, I would say like NGOs te would tend to fit under sort of the nonprofit banner. Now, they're not necessarily, it, they might not necessarily have like the government recognized nonprofit status in the like. 501cc or three or 501c6 cents, but that's not necessarily an issue. Uh, like those categories are mostly more in terms of like basic checklists for certain archetypes of organizations as opposed to our affiliate program is only aimed at like these three types of organizations. And if you're not one of those, but you're vaguely like a nonprofit in some sense, we don't want you. No, we certainly want you. Uh, and you know, if the checklist does not fit the organization, uh, reach out with the affiliate contact form and uh, we can certainly work with you to make sure like, uh, are you, you know, compatible with the spirit of these requirements? Uh, and uh, if so, like, how do we get you on board? Uh, certainly one of the things that I've been working on is uh, expanding the affiliate membership. Uh, and there's actually uh, Deb in the questions. Uh, question six uh, is maybe a good segue for this one. Do you want me to jump into talking about that one too? Sure. Uh, question six says, based on our previous talk, uh, has the OSI thought of how to leverage your strength in, with uh, open source allies to find out what are the issues that projects are having, challenges engaging and onboarding new users so as to find a lowest common denominator and help keep those projects thriving? Yes. So uh, one of the things that I did recently was I ran a member survey, so specifically targeted at our stakeholders who are either uh, affiliate or individual members uh, and asking for a bunch of feedback on a bunch of different things in terms of like long form questions. And uh, one of the questions I asked is, you know, what do you think like the OSI secret sauce is? Uh, what do you think the OSI is uniquely positioned to address that maybe other organizations are not? Uh, and one of the things that we heard from uh, that particular portion of our membership was the OSI is in this unique position where it kind of represents a broad coalition of interests and therefore could potentially uh, serve as sort of a staging ground uh, for a lot of these conversations that we need to be having. Uh, so certainly like I think State of the Source Conference uh, is potentially a great example of one of the ways that the OSI can help lead and foster those conversations. Uh, another thing that we are currently doing uh, specifically through the affiliate membership program, uh, which is sort of designed to bring together like user groups and foundations and other organizations like that, um, Italo took a gap year from the board, uh, but one of the things he did uh, before his departure was he ran uh, one uh, quarterly affiliate call, uh, which then I have uh, taken over. And so since then I've run uh, a number of quarterly affiliate calls where we bring all of the affiliates together, uh, giving them an opportunity to cross pollinate and discuss, you know, sort of, uh, recent topics of interest. So we've certainly uh, discussed events in the era of the global pandemic and open source sustainability and, you know, like putting out RFPs in order to find staff or volunteers. Like we, we've covered many, many subjects and uh, I'm hoping that uh, that is going to continue to be a forum for this in the future. And we continue to uh, increase our engagement uh, with these sorts of organizations. Uh, but hopefully that answers your question. Awesome. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit because some of these are, um, I want to make sure that we get like as much uh, breadth as possible. So I'm going to go to the eighth one on there and then we'll loop back around. Um, someone says, I am worried that the shift towards a SAF-centered organization will result in OSI becoming 
even more dominated by corporates with financial resources rather than independent developers and community contributors. Most of the board members seem to be representatives from American corporations, which are not always completely dedicated to open source. How can we ensure more diverse and international community representation on the board? I'll, I'll take that one. And I'm, I'm really glad that somebody asked the question because that's, you know, that's, that's an important subtext to be sensitive to and, and aware of. Um, first, I, I just want to share a little bit about my, my, my background. You know, I got into open source uh, through being a, a, a web developer, a freelancer, in fact. And uh, I was a freelancer using and benefiting from open source for, for well over a decade before, uh, before I entered, uh, shall we say, corporate America. Um, and so I, I, I can never forget what it was like to be a hobbyist and an independent uh, contractor who, who really uh, relied on open source. So I have that perspective in the back of my head at all times. Also, just philosophically, I, I'm very taken by the software freedom movement. And so that's always a perspective as well. Um, you know, when I first ran for the board in 2016, I just want to share one line you know, in my platform said, there's a vision for open source and it emphatically emphasizes the role of the individual open source committer in the face of corporate funded foundations that sometimes distort the true spirit of open source. Now, maybe that is a little bit provocative, but you know, that's, that's what election platforms are for, but that's still true today. You know, the, the thing that OSI really does that is more important than, that is so essential to fulfilling its mission is being a convener of different stakeholders and being a convener of stakeholders that can level a playing field as best possible so that nobody is uh, disadvantaged in these discussions. And so that means bringing together, uh, you know, people from, from the software freedom, freedom communities, people from corporate open source, hobbyists who are involved in open source, uh, humanitarian and, and uh, sort of nonprofit foundations and their use of open source. You know, all of these are really essential stakeholders for us to have at the table. Um, and this is why, you know, again, there's a lot that is US specific. And I think we're, we're very self-aware of that. And over the last four years, we've made intentional efforts to build out representation more, more internationally. Um, and if you look at the, the affiliate members that we've been recruiting, you'll see that reflected. You know, it's not just talk, we're, we're walking that walk. Um, and so not only are we making intentional efforts to improve representation globally, uh, but we are also looking to deploy uh, sort of new vehicles that will provide official forums for the community to, to come together and have these discussions. So for instance, many people are familiar with our license review and license discuss lists, but suffice it to say, not every discussion belongs there. There are other really valid and important conversations to be having about open source that don't neatly fit into licensing. And we would like to provide a forum for those discussions. So some of the things that we're thinking about, not only are we going to be hiring more staff and specifically looking at hiring someone like an executive director in the, in the future, uh, we're also looking at hiring a community manager and a communications manager to help us support a community engagement infrastructure that will help make sure that we systematically listen to everyone, everyone, and that we are not giving undue influence to, uh, to, to, to corporate sponsors. And I think one thing that's really important to mention, um, you know, not only are we going to be, we're, we're making investments to make sure that we can, in a systematic way, make sure that there's representation. Um, but there's, there's something that is important about the, the very DNA of open source initiative. OSI is a 501c3 nonprofit in the US. Now, that may be just a series of letters and numbers to some folks. Uh, but for folks like me who unfortunately have uh, an intimate knowledge of the U.S. tax code, um, that is very meaningful. You know, there are many foundations, nonprofits out there who are 501c6 organizations. And the difference between C3 and C6, you know, it's not crystal clear, but there's one very bright dividing line. And it's really important. And I want to mention this, and I hope that it sticks with you. OSI as a 501c3 nonprofit is required to act in the public interest is not allowed to do the bidding of our corporate sponsors. Yes, we can treat them as a stakeholder and we can fold their feedback and their, their, their views into, uh, into the work that we do, but this is not a pay to play scheme. We are legally required 
are legally prohibited from being a pay to play scheme. So just know that we are both operationalizing things to, to um, again, systematically listen to everybody and make sure everybody has a platform and a way to be heard. But there's also a legal backstop for us. There's that legal protection that, that really ties our hands in the things that we can and cannot do. So, um, you know, I can make all the, I can say all these things. I can assure you that there's that legal backstop. But I also want to say, like, please keep asking that question. Never stop asking that question because I won't always be on the board and these people won't always be on the board. And so the makeup of this organization will change over time. And so we need you to continue holding us to account as much as we are also working to hold ourselves to account. So uh, keep grilling us and, and thank you for the tough question. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. safe to say we'll have AMA again next year at State of the Source. Um, Ilana, like did you add? Up. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, just I wanted to specifically address the comment, especially because I think I did a bad job introducing myself. Uh, most of the board members seem to be representatives from American corporations, which are not always completely dedicated to open source. Um, so uh, four of the people uh, on this current panel are actually based in Europe. Uh, I'm Canadian, not American, not that that necessarily matters, uh, but I introduced myself as being an SRE from Red Hat because there is a legal requirement to do so, being a publicly owned company, not because they are my primary affiliation. So just to speak a little bit to how like the OSI elections work, uh, I did not work at Red Hat at the time when I ran for the board. I ran as an individual uh, while I was currently working at another company. And uh, I ran on behalf of the individual membership. So my job on the board is to you know represent their interests. Uh, I'm currently the membership chair, which means the majority of my activities on the board uh, right now, at least for me personally, are dedicated to advancing the interests of the individual and affiliate membership, not my employer. Uh, my employer is very supportive of me being on the board, which is great, uh, but uh, that is certainly not my uh, reason to be on the board. It's not part of my day job. Uh, and uh, it's it's not part of my goals for my term in the OSI, and I suspect a lot of other folks on the board, it's very similar for them. Uh, but uh, I think probably the majority of people on this panel are not necessarily in that position where they're working for an American for-profit company. Well, in yeah. particular, well, Faden um, actually pinged me on back too. Oh and he does work at a nonprofit, so maybe he'd like to speak to that too. I'll get you next uh, up. Yeah. So yeah, I think what what that uh, what what Lana is saying and what Josh, Josh is saying as well for for the for the C three part is that the, the board of the ASI doesn't have representatives, right? We are we are um, uh, members of a board um, uh, of a public charity, and 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 um, we're not representing anyone with a position here. Even if we're, I was an, an affiliate. I was nominated by an OSI affiliate and elected as such um, uh, on a seat, but. Um, I'm not representing the Wikimedia Foundation and, and my duties to, uh, to the board of directors uh, of the OSI. Um, the, the other part I would like to mention to the, to the substance of the question of our, our direction to a staff board, um, I think this, this would actually make it easier for volunteers to be in the board because they won't have to, you know, the current arrangement is that the board uh, in, in different degrees for each of us is a working board, right? Like they're, we're doing work as part of our, um, uh, participation in the board of directors. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the, of the people who do less work compared to some of my peers. I think it's challenging for, um, for someone that uh, is, is perhaps has another day job to also be in this board and do work for it. If, if we're an organization that um, uh, relies more on the staff to do the work and, and, and the volunteers on the board are there to provide strategy and direction uh, uh, and oversight, um, then I think it would become if, even easier for more volunteers to be part of this board. Um, more people that are not, uh, do not have open source in their day job, they're not working full time uh, as a community manager for a company or in an open source role. Um, Deb, did you want to follow up? Yeah, very, very briefly to so go to another question. Uh, and Fade, I'm, I'm glad 
you explain that this is not a representative board. That if a person happens to work for a company, they don't represent that company. It's very, very distinct. Not, not unlike the Apache Foundation, where uh, anyone who on the uh, the Apache Foundation board doesn't is not. They're not representing a an employer they may have. I have a really long view I wanted to mention just to give you a, a final perspective on corporate contribution and influence. Uh, in uh, my history with the board goes back to about 2007. I, I was uh, involved in our first uh, wave of governance reform before we had any member, uh, any membership, before we did any elections. And we went to our corporate sponsors. We had actually one. They were surprised to find out, which had been IBM for 10 years. And as we started talking to corporate sponsors about participating, we had originally intended for them to have a seat and uniformly said, no, we don't want to be involved in governance for OSI. What we want is for OSI to do their job to make sure the ecosystem is protected, that the OSD is defended, that we can rely on open source licenses. That's really what we need from you. We need you guys to do that. So really important to understand that relationship because I do under, I, I, I understand the express concern about corporate influence that it's always important with nonprofits. But that's been the, the history and the experience we've had with, uh, with uh, corporate uh, participation to date with OSI. Excellent. Um, and you can always spread it out by donating more as an individual if you like. We won't stop you. Um, let's go ahead. This was a lot of internal. I have a, we skipped over a question that's a little bit more external. Um, as OSI refocuses, where do you see the org fitting in with the larger ecosystem of FLAS related orgs? And then it says, related to that, is marketing the concept of open source the best use of time versus a license focus, license focus or something else? Can other orgs be allies in marketing the concept of open source, I assume? Does anyone want to speak? Yeah, Josh? Yeah, I'll just start with this one real briefly. Um, so part of the, the work that we're doing right now is not just sort of governance reform and operationalizing things, but we're, we're also setting strategy. Because for a while, OSI has been sort of a year-to-year -year strategy setting organization. Um, and we found that that is frankly been an, a, inadequate in preparing us to rise to the challenges that we face. Um, and so we're undertaking a multi-year uh, planning process and strategy setting process. And so while that's in flight, I can't give you terribly specific answers on this note, but I think there's at least one general thing that I can I can safely say, which is that our affiliate, the affiliate membership program uh, was really spun up with this in mind, um, with the idea that, you know, OSI derives its, uh, its, its power, its influence, you know, only through the consent of the community that we serve and only through, you know, the alliance with, with all of these people who share uh, share an understanding of the open source definition. And so um, I expect that working with our affiliate members and, and people who aren't yet our affiliate members, uh, just or other organizations generally, is absolutely gonna be core to uh, how we proceed. Um, because while we can, we, we are certainly working to improve our capabilities and do more, we can never do everything. And, and frankly, it doesn't make sense for OSI to do everything. And so where we find that there are organizations that are allied who have a, corp, a, a specialization in an area, um, you know, we would love to support them in that work and not only have OSI support them, but rally the rest of our allies to support them as well. You know, I've got this, this lovely scarf back here. It says Floss mm -hmm. United. Um, Thank you, Molly DeBlanc uh, and, and all the other folks who had a hand in crafting that. And that, that was a, a, a piece of swag that was a, a joint fundraising drive for the Software Freedom Conservancy uh, Open Source Initiative. See, there's Patrick's. Uh, and, uh, and also for the Free Software Foundation. And I think that's emblematic of where we wanna go. We, we want to move together as a community of, of individuals and organizations um, and marketing the, the, the benefits of open source and the meaning of open source, that's definitely gonna be part of it, but it's hard to say what that whole toolbox looks like at this moment. But I can assure you that we're gonna, we're gonna look to be a partner with the whole ecosystem as we endeavor to take on this work. 
And I'm not sure if anyone uh, wants to speak to this, but I know that since Floss United, there's been a push from within the board to not only partner with other US free software organizations, but to partner more internationally. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to some of that work. Or just Can take my word for it. Could I ask Patrick to talk a little bit about uh, our, our relationship with the Free Software Foundation Europe? Oh, yeah. You didn't think you were going to get out without answering anything, did you? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I feel a little awkward. Um, yeah, so, um, yes, the FSFE and the OSI um, have been working together on a few initiatives now. I'm trying to remember maybe three, four years of uh, activities. Um, gosh, some of them include things like um, public uh, uh, dollars, public code, um, uh, issues around um, standards. Uh, um, we, we sent Deb and, and Pam over to uh, uh, participate in the discussions uh, that were happening around um, standards in Brussels. Um, I know, I believe Italo is also working with the FSFE. Um, KDE, which is has a big um, group, uh, obviously based in um, Germany. Uh, we've been working with them. So um, trying to reach out with uh, to other organizations to leverage um, their expertise, their communities, their activities. Um, you know, there's sort of a saying that while I was at the OSI, sort of, more joiners and fewer starters. And so I think that that attitude has always been one of the driving forces behind the affiliate program in order to find partners uh, that we can do things with, um, um, complement one another. So uh, Mateus and, and, and I have been working quite a bit on a few things, whether conference events, um, the, um, you have to forgive me. It's been like a month uh, of me not thinking much about the open source initiative, but um, the uh, conference in Bolzano every year uh, we participate in, uh, which led to all sorts of uh, partnerships. That's where the uh, FUS community came from, the Italian schools. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities that exist. And the challenge with the OSI has always been do we have enough resources to take advantage? Do we have enough internal resources to take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there? That's always been the challenge. I would open my email every day with so many energetic, interesting, important projects being offered. Hey, can we get help with this? Oh, we see you're doing this. We'd like to participate. And I just, we just didn't have the capacity to take that on. I think what the OSI board is doing now by, by honing itself in order to take advantage of these opportunities is really the next level that has to happen because it's not for lack of interest on the OSI's part, it's for lack of resources and people to be able to respond in that way. So I know that the OSI not only would love to, but has the opportunity to take uh, to work with all these different groups, not just in Europe. We have outreach to uh, Asia, um, African uh, organizations are more and more involved in our affiliate groups um, now. Um, and it's just a shame that that all the potential that's there can't be realized. Um, and I applaud just, I'm still a member, so um, <laughs> I... <laughs> I applaud the work that they're doing to take advantage of these offers and recognize that that is a gap that needs to be filled. Sorry, I blabbed on. No, that, that was fabulous. And I'll just, I'll just briefly add con concretely, uh, you know, in the last year and a half, we have, I think actually two years, we've added uh, FOSS Asia, Linux Australia, and Open Source Community Africa to, uh, to our affiliates. Um, so just an, an example of how we are making really deliberate efforts to, to increase international representation. Excellent. Yeah. So I oh, also go ahead. Want to, yes, I also want to ask you, we make a lot of efforts to, to connect with the community in Asia and in Africa, as Patrick said. So I also like represent us uh, in different um, user group in Southeast Asia. If you ever want to be uh, to, to get um, connected with us, I please uh, contact me. Uh, if you are 
outside uh, there in Asia. And I just want to mention to them that I think we um, could take number five because I, I think that there's also some similar question to number five asking how a new uh, members could um, support this growing uh, community and they ask for different um, answer from the board so we only have uh, about five minutes so maybe it's a good question to to get the input from all the members uh, of the board here that's a great suggestion um so the question is what's one tip you have for new osi members who are actively looking to support this growing community and it would be great to get answers from different members so just one tip and then we're going to wrap it up um Hang Fuk, you, you put it out there. Do you want to go first? Uh, yes, I can go first. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, this, uh, so if you work for a company or, or an organization, so try to promote open source. They use open source, contribute to open source from your perspective, wherever you are. Yeah. Awesome. Um, anyone else with one tip for um, new folks? Chris, go ahead. Uh, well, one way um, to contribute to the OSI is to through the affiliates. So if you if you know of a particular affiliate that is um, particularly aligns with your interests or in your particular geographic area, for example, I mean, Open UK, for example, um, or Forsasia, I mean, contributing to that not only contributes to open source in general and all the um, all the all the great things that come with that, but also it you know it sort of funnels up to um, to to OSI in itself. So yeah, so through the affiliates is 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 my tip. Um, Ilana, maybe? Oh, uh, calling on Sorry. me on this one. I definitely want to echo what Chris said. I think there's a, a bunch of us on the board uh, who are all, for example, affiliated uh, with the Debian project. And like, uh, obviously, my, my service on the OSI board is my contribution to OSI, but it's not my only contribution to the open source ecosystem. Uh, I'm on the Debian Technical Committee, uh, and I maintain lots of packages in Debian. Uh, I uh, am a SIG lead in the Kubernetes project, and I kind of consider that like all you know to be relevant, like just being a good open source citizen uh, and uh, contributing to the community in the best way you can, whether that's, uh, you know, volunteering uh, to help organize events or uh, to like write code, write documentation, do graphic design, uh, help with triage and project management. Like there's so many ways that you can get involved. And uh, like, I'm always of the fan when people are like, how do I get involved in open source or this particular project or something like that. I say, well, what do you care about? You know, what do you want to improve? Uh, what do you have a stake in? Uh, go in that direction. And uh, that sort of drove me to join the OSI board because I said, well, I have a stake in this because, you know, I think that the organization could be uh, performing better. It's not performing up to its potential. It in theory, like, you know, represents this huge breadth of stakeholders. And right now it's very focused in its, uh, in, uh, in who it engages with and its activities. So how can we improve that? How can we broaden that? What would my strategy be as a board member to do that? Uh, so, I mean, obviously you don't have to join the board, but I'd be thrilled if you ran. <laughs> um, so Deb, go so ahead. I'm gonna make the suggestion without vetting it with Deb there first, but uh, if you want to engage more with OSI and you're not sure how to get started, there are a number of things that aren't as apparent. So as an example, we have a public policy working group meeting that's just a list right now that we need to you know, grow into a more active group. So my suggestion is write down what you're passionate about, what your skills are, what your interests are. Send an email to Deb Nicholson and say, when you're ready, I'd like you to tell me what my opportunity might be to volunteer or what else already exists that I can latch on to. So keep that in mind. It may be a, a shortcut to really matching up the thing that you, <laughs> you, you can do yourself. And we might find something for you here inside the organization, or um, I might say that your best bet is to work on getting more open source in use at your company and your day job and um, you know getting your your company to uh, be a good open source citizen, to borrow Alana's phrasing. Um, does anyone else want to add on uh, how new OSI members can get involved? Uh, I, I think uh, there is um, one thing that should be clear is that you don't need uh, to be uh, technically skilled to participate in open source. There is a lot of space for everyone. 
I have a degree in humanities and uh, uh, I started contributing uh, in communication in the open office uh, project uh, 18 years ago and uh, that is was just the start then I discovered that I could do a lot more localization uh, all software is basically written in English but there are 140 languages or even more in the world and uh, many people do not speak English or not fluent in English so localizing the software writing documentation helping with Q&A um, there is really fostering the community helping the community uh, there are there is quite a lot uh, for people that is not technically skilled or as not strong technical skills so it's uh, don't be shy uh, i think that being shy is the only real issue i'll go okay. ahead and jump in just with a, a brief plug <clears throat> since everybody's made all these fabulous suggestions i'm going to go ahead and slide in with a, a slightly um slightly selfish uh suggestion if i if i may say so myself um i would really encourage everybody everybody to become an OSI individual member. Um, there's a cost associated with that. It's like 40 bucks a year. We waive that cost for students and people who just can't afford it. Um, we, we want you as an individual member so that you get communications from us, that you get a voice in our board elections, um, and that you're just sort of engaged with all of the activities that we're doing. Beyond individual membership, affiliate membership has already been mentioned. Um, I will just say, reflect on the value you get out of open source. You're not just any philosophical alignment you may have on it, but really what has open source done for your career? How much value do you get out of it? How much value does your company get out of it? And if your company is not a sponsor of OSI, and if they're a tech company, they're definitely using open source software. I mean, everybody's using open source software one way or the other. If they are not a sponsor, it would be extraordinarily helpful if you could start making that case you know, and even if you can't make that case, connect them with us, connect them with Deb, uh, because we would we would love their support. Um, and, you know, every every additional member, every additional sponsor just helps us be that much more effective in serving the community. OK, um, and don't forget that contributing to open source is a huge amount of fun. <laughs> Excellent. There were a couple of questions. I'm just going to um, let folks know that we're going to take this on later because I don't think we quite have a chance to open a whole new topic on um, is part of our plan to look at ways to help on road or on ramp uh, newcomers and beginners and new contributors. And Josh, I know you said you're, we're kind of refocusing and maybe we don't totally have a, the most solid answer to that yet, but it's something we're kind of looking at this year. I don't know if you want to add to that or not, since we're, I would just say, we're um, about to get the moderator in. Jo jo join our mailing list, watch our Twitter. Uh, we we will not be quiet about the community engagement work that's that, that we're going to be rolling out. Um, we will be loud and proud of all the opportunities that, that we uh, sort of set up for people to get involved. And, and, uh, and it's not just about creating the opportunities, it is about creating that on-ramp and you know, meeting people where they're at in their journey with open source. Um, so just stay tuned. And uh, and in the meantime, while we're getting our work done, don't hesitate to send us your feedback or your suggestions because, uh, you know, that, that can inform the decisions that we make. Excellent. Anyone else have any closing thoughts or shall we yield the minute? Okay, thank you so much. This was a, I was uh, I loved all the questions that we got, and we have the notes, and I will um, we can everyone can take a look. And thanks for being on the panel, everyone. I f I'm glad we got to hear from everyone. It was really exciting. So, yeah. thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>